All right. Uh, welcome to the to lecture five. Uh, this is the first lecture that um, is going to be video recorded and, and posted on YouTube. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I guess I highly recommend having listened to myself speak uh, to to watch this um, on YouTube in uh, the, the the higher speed uh, viewing option. I think you can do that. Um, you can set it at you know one and a quarter, maybe one and a half speed. Um, so if you get if you get bored, you can you can skip ahead um, a little bit. This this lecture is going to be on on data mining. So data mining is um, actually kind of a misnomer. Um, I think the visual that it conjures up is um, of the you know the process of looking for and extracting data um, from some sort of database or obscure website or you know government lab or something like that. But um, really, what we mean by data mining is um, extracting useful, interesting patterns um, from existing databases, sometimes very large databases. Um, now, the process of extracting uh, the, the data to begin with and then cleaning it up, uh, putting it in a useful form or a form that um, facilitates easy exploration, um, is part of what we would call this sort of larger um, discovery process. But data mining itself is really um, taking a big database and looking for interesting stuff um, that then you can you know, tell a story um, with or answer a question, um, uh, especially when it comes to um, academic resor research um, or, you know, coming up with some sort of deliverable for a customer. Um, and so all of this would be, um, I guess it goes without saying, computationally based. So, uh, you know, a quick look on, on the internet um, will show you that there is, um, there are sort of competing standardizations um, for, for the data mining process. And, and one that um, is, is most prevalent um, is this KDD, Knowledge Discovery in Databases process. Um, and you'll see here that data mining is one part of this five step process. Um, so before we get to the point where we're pulling or using computers or, or um, algorithms or um, scripts or programs or whatever you want to call it to, to look for interesting patterns, um, we have to do a bunch of stuff to the data. Um, and some of that can be um, you know, particularly mind-numbing. Uh, but I don't think we're going to do too much of that in this class. I don't think we're going to do any real database management. Um, but we will go through the, the this five-step process in class. We'll you know do selection and and pre-processing, um, especially. Um, so data mining here is four. The other um, steps, um, as I mentioned, are selection. So that is as it sounds like, um, looking for and finding the data that's relevant uh, to the question you're asking. Um, Pre-processing, um, I guess another word for that would be um, sort of data cleansing. Um, sometimes there's missing data, sometimes there's data in there that doesn't make any sense, um, and sometimes the data is in a format that doesn't work with your, um, you know, whatever uh, language or software you're using, so that all has to be rectified before you end up doing something with it. Um, transformation is usually a mathematical approach where we are taking data um, and uh, converting it to a form that makes it more relevant to some sort of statistical analysis that we're going to perform on it. Uh, data mining itself um, there are a number of different approaches uh, you can use depending on what sector you're involved in. Um, and uh, the, the whole point there is again to, to, to fish out some sort of meaningful pattern uh, in the data that you have. 
Uh, and then the fifth and final step is interpretation and evaluation. Um, and you could even um, add on here visualization at the end, but we're going to have a separate lecture on visualization. So again, uh, data mining itself is some sort of um, automatic or semi-automatic, so computationally based analysis um, of large quantities of data, so big data. Um, and you know, the idea here is that you would be um, coming up with ways to discover previously unknown patterns. Um, so you imagine having a really big database um, and you, you know what it's from, you know what the source of the data is. Um, and you might have a guess about what might what patterns might be there. And that's especially true with the energy sector. I think the more conceptually you learn about the energy sector, you're aware of what patterns could be um, underlying uh, in, in the data. Um, and so some in some cases the data mining is just about sort of confirming the patterns um, are there, the ones that you already know, or quantifying the strength of the certain types of relationships. But in some cases, you can, you can sort of surprise yourself. Um, and, you know, data mining, depend, depending on what sector you're involved with, um, there's just a million and one different techniques. Um, we're going to go through um, uh, a couple really common, simple ones. Um, cluster analysis, that has to do with grouping things together. Uh, grouping usually objects together. So um, think about um, a database of, of households, um, you know, for, for an entire city, every household's energy consumption um, or something like that. You may be a, in a position where you want to group um, different types of energy consumers together based on some sort of common trait, um, which you can do mathematically. Um, anomaly detection um, can be object-based, so like households or people or consumers, um, or it can be a point in time if we have a time series of um, commodity prices or electricity demand or some sort of weather variable. Um, we may, you know, be able to recognize that one point it really should, you know, looks much much different, um, and you know there are different types of um, ways we can you know, classify a, a point in time as an anomaly based on its value. Um, but we have to also be wary of how we do that because sometimes points that look really strange and, and that we might statistically characterize as an anomaly could be real and have some sort of underlying interesting explanation. Um, classification, um, yeah, we're probably not going to do too much of in this class. Um, that has to do with coming up with algorithms that um, characterize things as, you know, junk mail or something that should go to your inbox based on, um, you know, text, uh, you know, in an email. Um, uh, you know, applied to the energy sector, it might look a little bit more like cluster analysis where we're, we're going through, you know, a big database of, of people's homes um, and classifying them as, you know, energy efficient or not energy efficient. Um, there's also image classification. Um, increasingly, um, aerial imagery is being used to uh, identify um, uh, objects um, and, you know, estimate their size and volume and, and then from that um, estimate what their energy consumption could be. Another uh, use of classification which will um, get into sort of towards the end of the class um, is identifying, um, uh, you know, higher resolution uh, signals in people's home energy uh, data, so load disaggregation, so taking, um, uh, you know, a, a, a signal of electricity consumption from somebody's home uh, without knowing what individual units or, or devices are being used, and based just on the shape of that signal, being able to disaggregate that and tell with some certainty, um, you know, what part of that overall signal is their dishwasher versus their dryer, etc. Uh, and then regression, I'm guessing most people are familiar with this. Um, there's a number of different types of regression. The, the most common that we all see is uh, 
um, linear regression or, or ordinary least squares um, uh, regression. Um, and this is just fitting a, a pattern to some observed data um, with the understanding that the pattern um, has some sort of goodness of fit, but also some error associated with it. So let's walk through this, this five-stage process. So the first, um, the first uh, the step is, um, is selection. I'm going to try to use a, a pen here to make it look a little bit like Khan Academy. Um, so this is what we would, I guess, um, you know, if you ask somebody on the street, this is sort of what they would think data mining means. Uh, where we're really pulling data from some sort of database. Um, and, you know, there there's two important parts to, to this. And the first is obvious, and we want to pull the right data, um, or at least the data that's relevant to the question we're asking. Um, we don't have to know exactly what we need, but we have to be pretty close. Um, and so that's, you know, part of why this class is going to focus just as much on the conceptual knowledge of the energy industry um, as much as we cover different analytical approaches. So if we have a uh, truly really big data set, um, there may be cases, um, you know, in that if we're trying to visualize some part of this data in its entirety, um, or we are running up against the, the limits of whatever computational power we're dealing with, or we just want to save time, uh, or we're doing a preliminary analysis and we don't want to, um, you know, deal with every single data point we have, um, when we would want to take a smaller subset uh, of the data to study. Um, and this is called sampling. So uh, take, for example, this plot. Um, we have on the y-axis some, some, you know, metric or variable. On the x-axis we have another metric or variable, and they're sort of related um, in a nonlinear way, right? So the, the larger the value of x in general, the larger the value of y um, at, at the extreme, and then at the other extreme, the smaller the value of x, the, the bigger the value of y. And in the middle, you know, more moderate values of x give you the minimum sort of value of y. But there's a lot of spread and variability here. Um, so this is a thousand data points and each point we can describe um, in terms of an ordered pair, so an x value and a y value. Well depending on um, what this data actually represents, um, we may be okay uh, just randomly selecting um, members of this data set with replacement. In other words, um, picking picking one sort of out of the hat and then going not you know and then sort of putting it back um, and then go, you know putting your hand back in and picking another one out of the hat uh, and doing that um, you know less than a thousand times, maybe a hundred times. I actually don't know how big this sample size is. You can see that if we do this randomly, um, if we're if we don't if we're just putting our hand in the hat and picking something at random, um, then the sample that we select should um, show the same general characteristics um, as as the much larger sample here. And you can sort of see that visually um, that you have the same general relationship between x and y here. So one of the examples that I've talked about already is um, this idea of, of household energy data. And, and, you know, to my knowledge, that's really um, in one of the main instances where you would be dealing with um, databases that, that are so large that, that you might have to um, do some sort of sampling. Um, and, you know, the other could be, the, you know, the other example I mentioned um, if you're looking at, um, you know, if you're using aerial imagery to, you know, estimate 
electricity demand based on the presence of, of structures, right? Buildings, you could maybe estimate how tall they are, uh, their volume, um, and then estimate their heating and cooling, you know, demands. Um, that could be another one, and I'm sure there are others. Um, you know, but energy analytics in general, um, I think it's big data, but it's probably not big enough that you're going to ever need to to do a, a small smaller sample. I don't think you're ever going to run up against the the limits of uh, of computation if you're just doing sort of an analysis. Now, if we're if we're modeling electric power systems, which we'll talk about towards the end of the sister uh, system or semester. Um, then you do have to sort of make some concessions for, for computational power and, and just time. So the second step um, after we do data selection um, is pre-processing. Um, and this is the least fun, honestly. Um, and if you're involved in research um, or if you're in any sort of um, analyst job, um, this is sort of what lies ahead of you. Um, inevitably, data sets are imperfect. Um, and you can think about, you know, there being a million reasons why. Um, a lot of it's instrument error. Um, if we're measuring something, then we have something that's doing the measuring, right? Whether it's a thermometer or a stream gauge or, um, you know, a weather balloon um, or, you know, a, a plug on... Uh, a monitor on, you know, a device, um, these can all go wrong. Uh, and so if we're measuring things over time, inevitably we're going to have some weird points. And we want to get rid of that stuff. Um, and sometimes it could be missing, sometimes it could be just nonsensical. Um, and so, uh, you know, a special circle of hell is, resolved for, is reserved for the, the people whose job it is to go through through and do that by hand, right? So normally we want to come up with more automated ways to search through a database and make some sort of decision about is this data correct? Uh, if it's not, um, you know, interpolate some other value. Or if there's missing data, do the same. You know, fill that data in, make a best guess about what should be there. Now how exactly we deal with that depends on whether we're talking about a database of objects. So for example, a list of homes and their energy consumption in a month or something, or a list of coal plants or power plants, um, or if we're de dealing with a time series. In other words, uh, you know, a, a record of uh, hourly electricity demand over a year, um, or coal prices over a certain period of time. Uh, it may also depend on what other type of data is, is available. The first option, which is one I wouldn't necessarily suggest, um, but depends on what situation you're in, is just to ignore it. Um, you delete the data point. Now, this could work if you're talking about a database of objects, right? So if you're looking at, if you have a database of, you know, 100,000 homes and you, you're looking at their energy consumption data and one looks just bizarre, um, you could you could delete it. Um, now that might not work if you're talking about a time series. Um, you know, if you have a time series of, of annual natural gas prices and one year is missing, um, then you know, depending on what you're doing with that time series, uh, a gap in that in that record would be problematic. And, um, for example, if you were using that as some sort of as part of some sort of simulation model. Um, you would need a value there, otherwise you would have a, a gap in time and, and your program might fail. So if we're missing data, um, there's a couple um, other options we can do besides just stick our head in the sand. Um, we, can, we can try to um, replace the data um, with the most common value, and this is, this is, these are all options for replacing missing data when we're talking about object data, so um, not a time series, not a record of, of something through time, but more sort of a catalog of a bunch of different things. So the example here at the bottom is different customers, A, B, C, and D, um, and I guess how much of each thing they buy, so 25 units of cereal for customer A, uh, 
31.25 units of milk, whatever that means, and a lot of spoons. Um, so you can see each customer has a value for cereal, milk, and spoons except for customer C. Um, and we don't know how many spoons they bought, but we do know how, how much cereal and milk they bought. So one option here uh, we could replace with the most common value. Um, so imagine if this database were, were much larger um, and we found that the most likely number of spoons that any customer bought was 45, one option would be to just fill in 45 for customer C. Um, we could also replace with the mean value, so the average value of, of, of spoons bought, which is a little different than the most common value, uh, and do that. Um, we could also perform uh, a silly type of regression here. So we could say that we could assume um, that uh, the number of spoons someone buys um, is related, or we could see if it's related, um, to the amount of cereal and milk they buy, which could be true, uh, but it could also be, you know, not true, uh, and we'd have to find that out, but we could fit a regression relationship, which is shown under the table there, um, and in that case, we would be finding the value of A, B, and C, uh, little a, little b, and big C, which would be the, the constant, um, um, that comes up with the value that's a, the best predictor of the number of spoons everybody buys for customer A, B, and D, right? And then whatever that model is, that best fit model, we would then apply to customer C and make a guess about how many spoons they bought. Um, so the other uh, option is imputation. Um, so this would involve saying, well, it's a little more sophisticated than, than coming up with the, the most common or mean value. Um, if we knew something about customer C, and in particular if we knew that, that customer C really wasn't much like customer B or customer D, but it was most like customer A in some respect, um, we might be justified in saying, okay, well, we'll just assign the, the number of spoons that customer A bought to customer C. So that's for, for object data. Um, for, for time series data, it's a little different. Um, you know, it depends on how much data is missing. Sometimes, if it's just a, it's a lot of data that's missing, um, that affects the choices you make in terms of what you're going to do. I mean, I've run into cases where, you know, if there just isn't temperature data or, you know, data about water availability um, back far enough in time, then that means you just, you're, that's when your model stops, right? You can't, you can't model something um, that, that doesn't have any existing data um, to train the model. Um, so, it's, you know, it, if there is um, just a little bit of, of data missing, then there's some options um, for, for filling those blanks in. Uh, so to speak, and, and the first again would be imputation, um, and you could identify. In this case, we have uh, days one, two, three, four, and we're looking at the maximum temperature in each day, um, and we also know peak electricity demand during each day, and we also need uh, know the off-peak electricity demand um, for each day. Um, so, for example, if we if we decided that we looked at um, each of these days and, and what we really want to know is what their electricity demand is like, because we know what the temperature is for all four days, but uh, the electricity demand data for day four is missing. Um, one option would be to say, all right, well, let's look at what, the, what information we do know, which is temperature, and it's most like day three. Um, I guess we could just simply substitute day three's values. Uh, for peak and off-peak electricity demand, so we would just drop. We would assume that day four's peak demand is 1,400, and and day four's off-peak demand is 84 or uh, 840. Uh, a better approach in this case, especially when you're talking about electricity demand, 
um, is regression. Um, although even that is a mistake, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about why. There are very specific ways you would model electricity demand. Um, you know, temperature is an important one, um, but it, you have to go a little bit beyond that. Um, so for regression, again, here we're assuming that there's a direct relationship between temperature and peak and off-peak electricity demand. Um, and so if we wanted to find peak demand for day four, we would build a relationship between peak demand and temperature for all the other days for which we do have information. Um, and we would fit, we would find the values of, of little a and, and big C here in the bottom uh, in the equation underneath the table um, that result in estimates of peak electricity demand that are closest or have the least error um, when when we're describing uh, days one through three, and then we would take that model and apply it to day four um, and make a guess about how much peak electricity demand there was, given the fact that the maximum temperature was 90. We can also, uh, with time series data, do linear interpolation. Um, and so, you know, in some cases, um, this might mean that, you know, if, if we are looking at a situation where we know the, the information for day one, we don't know uh, the information for day two, and, uh, their electricity demand, we don't know the day three electricity demand, but we do know day four, um, you know, we, I guess we could make an assumption that um, if we know that demand over the next couple, if we could assume that demand over the next couple of days after day one increases uh, to, to eventually reach 1300, go, it goes from 1000 to 1300 in terms of peak electricity demand, uh, we could assume, it may be a bad assumption, that that increase is linear, right? So that each day, the first day it increases by 150, and then on day three, um, or I'm sorry, uh, the the first day it would go up by 100, from 1,000 to 1,100. Uh, on day three, it would go from 1,100 to 1,200, and then from three to four, it would jump from 1,200 to 300. Um, now, when we're talking about electricity demand, that's a, a pretty silly assumption. Um, there's no reason why things would have to increase like that, although it could be, it could be true. Um, but it's a better idea, I think, in this case, to do a regression based on, on temperature. But even that would be a sim very simplified approach. Okay, so that we went through selection, um, and we went through uh, the data cleaning, um, and now we're ready for transformation. And so, um, you know, that the, the need for, for transformation of the data is, is going to depend on what particular statistical analysis you want to perform on it. Um, and really the most common one that, that I use um, um, is trying, you know, it's you all, a lot of statistical tests that we use are, are based on this assumption that the data is normally distri distributed or, or it fits to some sort of Gaussian distribution. Um, the normal would be a Gaussian with zero mean um, and, a, and a variance of one. Um, so it, if, if we want to get data in that form and we're dealing with um, some sort of variable that is not normally distributed, there are options um, for us to convert d data to that doesn't fit this bell curve. Um, and math, you know, perform some sort of mathematical function on it, um, and then it turns it into data that is is normally distributed. Then we can do whatever statistical test we want to do on it, um, and then transform it back afterwards. Um, so one example of that would be, you know, if you want to estimate a confidence interval. Um, so you have some um, estimate of, of the of the mean of a population. So a population would just be. Um, you know, uh, something you're, you're trying to describe statistically, you have some s sort of data sample 
and then you realize that that sample is, is just, as we talked about at the very beginning, only a part of a subset of this much larger data set that you have. Um, if you want to make um, a guess about what the, the population um, mean uh, is plus and have some some confidence within a 95% probability that that that, um, that that mean is going to be within this sort of plus or minus interval, um, you can calculate a confidence in, interval. Um, now, for well, normally when we talk about this, um, calculating a confidence interval for a normal distribution um, means you're just um, adding uh, and subtracting two times um, the the standard error or the standard error units to get the confidence interval plus or minus the mean. Um, but doing this um, requires means that you're you are you working on an underlying Gaussian or, or normal distribution. So it wouldn't work um, if your data looked like this. If it had uh, if it was skewed to the right or it had a really fat tail is what we would call this. Um, and many processes, uh, especially environmental processes um, or economic processes that depend on um, environmental processes like electricity demand or some types of commodity prices are not normally distributed. They are log normally distributed or there's some other distribution out there that's a better fit um, for what they look like. And so in this case, on the y-axis here, we have uh, the relative frequency or probability um, of occurrence and then on the x-axis some sort of value. Um, so this is a, a probability distribution based fitted to um, a histogram um, of you know the sample of some sort of data. So this does not look normal. Um, it's very asymmetrical. So if we want to come up with a confidence interval for that data that has a really fat tail, um, we have to convert it to a normal, a normal or, or Gaussian distribution, um, at least temporarily. Um, and so for data that is log normally distributed, um, that you have a reasonable confidence is, is log normally distributed, um, for every point in your data set, you can take its natural logarithm. Um, and when you do that and then replot the histogram, um, the data ends up looking like a Gaussian or, or in, in this case, Gaussian uh, distribution. Um, and once we do that, then we can compute the confidence interval um, and then transform those values back um, using this mathematical relationship shown at the bottom. Um, Every value that we transformed, we can then take the exponent of, uh, of that um, in order to transform it back to x, our, our original um, data that is log normally distributed. Uh, so there's, there's a number of ways you can um, ascertain whether the data that you have is normally distributed and one of those is using a quantile quantile plot which just graphs observed versus uh, theoretical normal quantiles um, and what you what you really want is, is to see this data distributed perfectly along this diagonal line so in this plot here each little circle is a is a different comparison of um, observed versus theoretical normal quantiles. Um, and you want those to match up perfectly and be this straight or um, diagonal line. Um, in this case, we can see that most of the data is normally distributed, but um, at really low values, um, that relationship starts to break down. Uh, we have some values that are below um, the diagonal line, and we can see that at very high values, the, the relationship starts to break down a little bit. For, but for most of the um, the distribution, it looks pretty normal here. Um, and there is a, a function in MATLAB that allows you to develop these QQ plots um, for data that you're dealing with, and that's the QQ plot um, function uh, shown in italics at the bottom.
So in other cases, um, you know, if we if we already have data that's um, either exists naturally as a as a normal or Gaussian distribution, or we've already converted it. Um, in some cases, we may want to process it a little bit more in, in order to whiten it. Um, and all this means is converting data to a standard normal distribution. So um, a, a normal distribution with mean equal to zero and variance equal to one. Um, and if we have an existing uh, data set that is log normally distributed, for example, um, we could we could take the, the following steps. Um, first, we would do what we already suggested, which is uh, take the natural log of each data point in order to convert it from that distribution that looks um, you know sort of like this with the really long fat tail uh, in order to get it to, to the bell curve, right? Um, that's my bell curve. Um, so that would be step one. We take the natural log of, of each data point. So then it's normally just or Gauss, you know, it's normally distributed, but it's not the standard normal. So we might not have data that is mean centered at zero with variance of one. To whiten it, in order to get it to a standard normal distribution, um, we subtract the mean um, of our of our data and we divide by the standard deviation. Um, so we that's, this is what we do right here. If we have a data set. Um, y, which is our um, transformed data, right? So it, we, we took this log normally distributed data and, and, and normalized it. Um, then we can subtract the mean of y, divide by the standard deviation, um, and then we get this distribution that is a bell shape, um, a standard normal distribution. So not only does it look like a bell shape, but it is centered at zero. And this one, let's say that one was centered at eight or something like that. So that means that the this value of um, right here would be eight, right? If this one was eight up here, the mean was eight, then we'd have to subtract eight here, divide by the standard deviation, and we get a, a nice standard normal distribution down here. So again, if we do that, um, if we convert, take this two-step process, we're going from log normally distributed data, we're transforming it using the natural logarithm, and then we're whitening it. Ultimately, we, we get something that looks like this. Um, now, think how you would try to convert this back to the original log normally distributed data from here. Um, and there are some reasons why you might want to do that. Um, you know, usually if we if we get data to this point, it's because we want to do something to it. Like we could, you know, increase its variance or, um, you know, transform it in some other way, but eventually we want to convert it back. Um, so we just sort of retrace our steps. Uh, we would multiply times the standard deviation that we divided by, add back the mean, and then take the exponent. Okay, so now we're at the data mining step, um, and I briefly outlined um, the, the four things we'll sort of talk about in, in this lecture. And the first is anomaly detection. So um, it's, um, you know, could be an outlier, a statistical outlier, um, and that doesn't mean it's not real. It just means that um, we have sort of permission from the st 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 um, from the stat gods to just sort of remove it from consideration, um, uh, or it could be something that just doesn't look right based on you know deviation from um, normal values, or or there's some sort of step change that looks really strange. Um, but the bottom line here is you're identifying unusual data records um, that that might be interesting. I mean, you might want to. Uh, remove them if they're errors, or they could be. You could be looking for anomalies in order to study them more closely. Um, again, clustering is the task of um, discovering groups and structures in the data that are in some way similar to each other. So we're sort of taking a big database and we're saying, let's figure out the you know the the best way mathematically to 
to take this you know very very large database and put it into eight different groups where within each group everything is kind of more similar than they are with members of other groups. Um, classification um, is, is the task of generalizing some sort of known structure um, you know like classifying yeah, a program that might classify email um, as you know spam or, or legitimate for your inbox uh, and generalizing that to apply to new data right so classification algorithms usually are trained um, they um, you know parameterize themselves um, they, they act on you train them based on some sort of existing data set you make sure they do well sorting the data you do have and then you give it a test right you you um, give it new data and you, and you um, Try, then try to make sure that it does just as well classifying this new data. Um, and then regression, again, attempts to find some sort of function that models the data with the least error. So for anomaly detection, um, there's, a, there's a couple different um, pretty you know, just really simple standards to use. The first is min-max. Um, you know, the, or the other is using some sort of um, uh, parameter of a statistical distribution, like um, you could say we, we want to identify as an anomaly anything beyond two or three standard deviations away from the mean or something like that. Um, you know, the basic idea here is to create some sort of filter, right? If you have a lot of data, you could create a filter that goes through the data and says, um, you know, it, from our conceptual understanding of the underlying system, um, we know for a fact that objects can't have a value greater than some max or lower than some min, and we can design a simple program to search for any objects um, with values outside that range. So besides a, a really simple uh, minimum or maximum um, filter, again, I mentioned you, you could come up with a, um, a filter that if you if you think your data is normally distributed, um, now this doesn't work otherwise, but if you have data that's normally distributed, you could say, all right, any, any data that's um, outside of the 99th percentile, right? So if, if it's um, far, what, far enough um, uh, below or above the mean um, that I have, um, you know, uh, less than or equal to a 1% chance of experiencing that data, um, then we'll flag it, right? So we'll, we'll remove it or, 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 or flag it for further study. So again, clustering, um, you know, the, the whole idea here is to, you know, discover naturally sort of occurring groups in the data um, that are internally similar. Um, all members of, of the group would be um, more similar with each other than with members of other groups. Um, and it's a little hard to pin down an exact definition on, on what a cluster would be, but that's, that's part of why there are so many algorithms for doing this. Um, but the, the upshot here is that you're really just grouping data into different objects. Um, but um, there, you know, there are a number of different cluster models um, that are out there, and we'll cover just maybe one or two. Um, but I think it should be understood that there's just a million different ways you can, you can design a cluster model or you know, design ways to group data into different um, uh, different clusters. So one of the, the cool things about um, clustering algorithms, um, and it's probably easiest to explain using two dimensions, um, or even one dimension, but you know, let's go a little, little higher. Um, but you know, imagine if you had a, an XY axis, um, and you had a bunch of data so here's your y-axis, here's your x-axis. Um, so think back to that original sort of cluster, right? So not cluster, but 
scatter plot, right? So you have data all over here, uh, and we can describe each of them in terms of uh, an ordered pair, right? So an x value and a y value. Um, and when we're doing a cluster analysis, um, we want to cluster these in space, right? But our x value and our y value might be something that we really care about, not just a random x and y. It could be the cost of some sort of generator uh, and its reliability or lack of reliability. Um, or these could be customer groups and the x-axis could be the size of the house and the y-axis could be energy consumption or something like that. Um, or income or anything like that, right? So we can make clusters um, based on two dimensions here in terms of an x and a y, but we don't have to stop there. Um, the, the process is not limited to just looking at two dimensions. We can go to three or four or five um, and really come up with a pretty robust way of grouping um, objects into, into groups. So one of the um, one of the most the, probably the easiest to, to wrap your head around um, clustering algorithms is the k-means clustering, and this is just what I showed you. So we have an x and a y dimension, x-axis, y-axis, and we have a bunch of different data. These dots um, that are distributed in this x-y space, right? They they can describe each individual dot as an ordered pair, an x value and a y value, um, and depending on those values, they end up somewhere in this big square. Um, and we, you could sort of imagine that at first all these dots are black, right, or red or, or, or green, but they're all the same color. And what we want to come up with um, is an algorithm that looks at all this data and identifies, um, you know, we can input we want four groups, or three groups, or two groups, or ten groups. In this case, it's four. So we want an algorithm that will take an input from the user um, that we want to, you know, cluster this data into four groups, and it will identify the four groups um, that that minimize um, this argument at, at the at the bottom, this equation. Um, and what this what this is basically doing is it's saying each one of these objects here is an x, this is an, each x here is an ordered pair, right? Each one of those, this x means every set of, of, of all these ordered pairs. Um, and what we want to do is minimize um, over each one of these groups, um, over group one, group two, no matter how we configure them, group three and group four, we want to minimize the sum of or the distance between each individual point, so like this little blue dot, and the middle, and then this little blue dot, and the middle. And we do that for each one, so we'd also do that for the green cluster up here, each, each dot in the middle, right? So we're, what we're really doing is figuring out how we can draw circles around these dots, or at least classify them, or, or group them into colors, that we're minimizing the, the, the sum of all the distances between the centroid um, or, the, or the mean, the, the center of the group, and um, all the points that are distributed around it. Um, and you could imagine that that's sort of a lot of work to do by hand, but for a computer it's just this algorithm. It's sort of a search algorithm. It tries lots of different combinations until it finds the way to to color all these dots so that it minimizes that. So there are a couple other clustering techniques besides k-means. Um, and there's an example of, um, of k-means that I, I guess I'd, I would highly recommend going through. This is the geometric or k-means method um, with uh, example from the, it directly, that's a directly applied to MATLAB. And then um, there's another here, uh, hierarchical clustering, which you could take a look at as well. Okay, so then there's classification. Um, uh, you know, I don't think we're really going to do 
much classification until we get to um, the non-intrusive load monitoring. So that's the, the energy demand disaggregation towards the end of the semester. Um, and even that's not, I don't, I mean, it's, it's a type of classification, um, but you know most classification that you really hear about um, from a machine learning perspective um, is text-based. Um, so going through, um, you know, different, e you know, emails or other types of texts and and, and classifying them as in some way. Um, you know, for for our purposes, um, you you could apply classification algorithms. Um, to, to numerical data, energy related data. Um, you know, you could, you know, examples would be looking at, peer, you know, records of precipitation and rainflow and describing them, you know, as a drought or not a drought or electricity demand. You have some sort of way of classifying it as a peak or not peak period. Um, power plant emissions, dirty or clean. Um, home electricity consumption efficient or not. Um, I mean, the idea is to take a database that already appropriately classifies objects according to some sort of criteria which you set, and then to train it um, to, to similarly classify a bunch of new objects that haven't been analyzed yet. Um, and there's a um, there's an example of different types of classification that you can. Uh, look at again. The link is at the bottom. I would I would suggest doing that. So the last data mining um, approach we'll cover in, um, very briefly here today is regression. Um, that we're going to spend a lot more time um, on regression uh, later on in the semester. Um, but the whole idea here is you're, you're trying to model the relationship between a response variable, um, so an output, uh, and some other predictor or group of predictor or input variables. Um, and it's a, you know it's similar to classification in that it's a it's a you know it's a training algorithm. You're, you're taking some sort of existing data set that you have. Um, you're building a model that does well to predict that existing data and then really you want to use it to predict something else. You want to apply it to new forms of data to make predictions or estimates about um, the output variable. Um, and so these models can have a number of, of different forms and you know usually we, we think about um, linear regression as being um, just a straight line but that doesn't always um, have to be have to be the case. I mean, or it doesn't necessarily have to be linear here. We can have exponents here, or we can have um, different uh, variables a, b, and c that interact with one another. So here, y is the output variable. That's what we're trying to the process we're trying to model, or maybe even predict. And what we're assuming here is that, given some sort of value of a, b, and c. Um, we can we can come up with um, coefficients that would go in front of a, b, and c, uh, or multipliers that no matter what value of a, b, and c we have, correctly or while, while minimizing error, predicts what the value of y would be. Um, and you can see there's all sorts of different forms you could use, um, and the, you know the forms you use here would be. Maybe based off of your understanding of the physical system you're trying to model, or maybe um, you know selected with help of, of of a fitting algorithm. So we're going to go uh, into much more depth about regression again. So I would just look um, again through the the MathWorks um, workflow example. Um, and just, you know, just go through it to make sure you, you sort of know what, what's happening. So that's the end of the first lecture. Um, these are the references I used throughout. Um, unfortunately, they are not, um, it's not specified throughout where I'm pulling things from. Um, but these are all resources that you could um, take a look at if you're curious. Um, 
you know, I'm, look, I'm looking at the clock. I spoke for about an hour. That's about 20 minutes, at least longer than I wanted to talk. Um, so that's, I'm sorry it, it was so long, but it's informative for me. I'll, I'll try to keep it a little shorter in the future. Um, all right, uh, I'm going to go put this on YouTube. Thanks.